Oh, hello, and welcome to Citanium Mine. I was just singing about surviving. It, it's lonely down here. I'm surviving in the mine. You see, also, just random thought. Do you guys remember Vampire Survivors? It was a game that came out a couple years ago. It was very, very good. It was my favorite game of 2022. If you don't believe me, go back and watch my every game I played from 2022, from best to worst. It's uh, right there at the top. You don't even have to go very far in to find it. But the point of the matter is, is that Vampire Survivors really spearheaded this genre of what we call bullet heavens, uh, reverse bullet hells, wh whatever you want to call them. Uh, the general idea being that you take your character into this big old open space that has hordes of enemies coming at you, and you gain experience and money and abilities so that you can better deal with the hordes that are coming at you. Uh, and it is uh, very mechanics light in Vampire Survivors. You basically just move. That's basically all you do. You just have a movement button, and then you make choices every time you level up or get new equipment to outfit your character. Very simple, straightforward. You're on the timer, you try to run out the timer and complete a run. This is a very good formula. It is a very addictive formula. It has, like, loot boxes, and it has some decision-making, but it's also incredibly easy to wrap your heads around what you're doing in the game. The point of the matter is, since this has spawned so many new, interesting games, I thought that I would give you a little taste of a few I have played recently. And so, I'd like to just start with one that has kind of become emblematic. I think, of the genre as well, and it's called Halls of Torment. So Halls of Torment is basically if you took Vampire Survivors, but you said, I'd like it to look and feel a lot more like Diablo 2. That's pretty much it. Uh, you start with a selection screen for your heroes. Uh, your heroes will kind of feel like Diablo 2 characters. You've got your warrior, you've got your ranger, you've got, like, a sorcerer. It's going to feel familiar if you're familiar with the Diablo series, but it definitely looks like a Diablo 2, or maybe even a Diablo 1. But it is in that pixel graphic style. It's in, like, that pseudo 2.5D plane perspective, and it basically tasks you with going into these different planes of existence, these levels of hell, whatever you want to think of them as, and shooting a bunch of characters that are coming at you. And they are kind of demonic by nature. I think it's really important to understand that with every single one of these, the thematic part about it is going to be pretty much superficial. It's really about how they play, but I do appreciate it when a game can really bring about the idea, the the atmosphere of what they're trying to do. And I think Hells of Torment does a pretty good job of that. If you wanted to feel like you were doing a Vampire Survivors, but it was Diablo 2, they have completely encapsulated that with this game. Something that is really interesting about this is that you move around this this huge map. So in this way, it is very similar to Vampire Survivors. You move around this huge map. There are some environmental traps that you can spring. There are ways that you can get other abilities that will activate, but it is not as reliant on that. There were many times when I was doing runs in Halls of Torment where... I only filled out, like, three spaces for my other abilities, and there's, like, six listed there, so I don't know how you fill out all of them. Also, your special skills that you can get, uh, there is, like, a, a list of where you can put them, and I rarely had that half full, so I don't know if that's just aspirational for me <laughs> or not, but... It is not really as reliant on that. It's it's definitely more about trying to upgrade the skills that you currently have. So, for instance, if you swing a sword, it's basically about becoming the best sword swinger you could possibly be. If you are a magic user, it is about being able to make the best fireballs you could possibly make. And then, when you choose some special skills to try and figure out 
really what you want to enhance because you're not going to get a ton of opportunities to really raise them up specifically. This is a fine way to do things. I I'm perfectly fine with it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have the kind of synergies that you could do with Vampire Survivors uh, because you, you aren't getting as many of those upgrades and modifications. But if they want to focus on that, that's perfectly fine. You also have directional controls, I should mention in this, where you have to aim. You, you aim. There might be an auto-aiming feature, but I don't usually use that. This This one you do aim, which means that it is two different kinds of mechanics you use rather than Vampire Survivors where you use the one. This is getting too complex. Now I've got to aim and run. I don't like <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, no, it's perfectly fine. It works great. It keeps you a little bit more engaged. Both of your thumbs have to be firmly planted on the controller when you're doing it. You level up at a pretty good clip. Uh, there are some pretty great combinations that you can do if you do unlock some of the traps and area of effect spells and then you utilize that by increasing your area of effect you can do some massive damage and of course you get these great big light shows by the end something that is really interesting about halls of torment though is if you remember vampire survivors at the end of a 30 minute mark uh the reaper comes and just kills you right uh, that's kind of the whole thing, is that you can finally make it to the 30-minute mark, and then everything goes away, and the Reaper comes, and and smacks you once, and you, and you die. And that's how the runs end, because the runs always kind of have to end like that. Uh, Halls of Torment, it doesn't do that. At the uh, end of a run, a boss shows up. And when the boss shows up, you have to defeat the boss. And if you defeat the boss, congratulations, you have... Well, you've defeated the boss. You've completed the run, essentially. And, and so there is actually like an end point, a victory to be had. There are also, over the course of your run, other mini-bosses that show up that are like named bosses. They're not just elite monsters. They're not just characters that have like a red aura around them or something. But they're like specific monsters that need to be defeated. There are even awards for killing them off specifically. And so this actually gives a little bit of variety to Halls of Torment as you're going through it. Also interesting, uh, Halls of Torment has an equipment system. You find equipment in the dungeons and then you can put them on different characters. And these will enhance your general stats in order to get new equipment, you have to liberate them from the dungeons. This is something I wasn't as fond of, honestly, because you'll pick up a bunch of different things. Sometimes, you know, four or five different uh, objects. Boots and hats and gloves. But it will only really let you bring one back. You have to travel back to the well that's at, like, the beginning of the area, and you have to pick one of those items to ship on up. Uh, and then after you shipped it up, you still have to buy it with coins from the vendor. It's it, In similar fashion, it's how you upgrade the potions, because you can get potion upgrades, you can send those up, then you have to, like, buy the potion upgrade so that you can unlock the bonus at the potion shop. It's a few too many steps, personally. I, ju I just think it's too too many steps. If I find items in the game and you're going to make me pay for them, just just have them available after I've unlocked them in the dungeon. It doesn't have to be more complicated than this. You've, you've overcomplicated this system. And considering that it's not a hugely utilized piece of the game, there's just more there than you really needed to do. The levels themselves are... Uh, pretty stock in terms of what you expect. There's an ice world, there's a, a bridge that's more of like a linear one, there's there's a fire world. You know, the, the kind of things that you would imagine in a dark fantasy. It's got those. Cool retro sound effects. I think it was a good. Is it as good as Vampire Survivors? Uh, no. Spoiler alert, n n none of these are as good as Vampire Survivors. Vampire Survivors was like 
a masterpiece. Come on. In its simplicity, it was a masterpiece. But that isn't to say that you shouldn't play Halls of Torment. I especially think that if you like the idea of feeling like you're playing Diablo 2, but with vampire survivors mechanics, you're gonna really dig this. And it does a few really interesting things with the formula, like the equipment system, and the environmental traps and being able to lay those down. I think that it's it's interesting enough and you should try it out. You get some really interesting character classes uh, over the course of the game too. And you'll start to find certain ones that you like more than others. There's like a hub world that you get to like explore around at a camp. Uh, you know, some, some neat stuff there. Brotato is... A whole different kind of game, it feels like. Uh, first of all, the style. Uh, Brotato looks like Alien Hominid. It's got this cartoony, like, drawn on the back of a napkin kind of comic panel style, where it's like the really heavy black lines around everything. and It looks good, actually. I, I thought that it looked good, uh... But it is very different than the kind of pixelated style that you're used to in a lot of these games, usually paying homage to the fact that Vampire Survivors had that same style. The general idea of Brotato is that you are a potato who watched too many Rambo movies. Now you're the Brotato, and you use guns. You're a potato that wields guns now. All right. Some interesting things about Brotato. First of all, the arena is very small. By comparison to other games in the genre, it is it is very small. In fact, you can see the borders of your arena uh pretty much if you just move a little bit down or a little bit up. It's it's very small. Uh it is even smaller if you have certain characters. It will even shrink down a little bit. So it's a very claustrophobic, contained sort of world that they've created for Brotato, but that kind of works with the way that they've structured the game. Because the game is not structured as like a 30-minute survival mission. It's structured as a leveling system where you go through 15 different levels to get to a boss that you defeat, and at the end of each of these stages, you go to essentially a shop where you can equip different stuff, and you can buy new upgrades and trade out guns or whatever you want to do. And then you go in for the next stage after you've equipped what you can equip with the money that you have. Each one of these stages that you're in, though, is very short. You're only spending like a minute in one of these arenas before you move on to the next one. There are also a few places where they'll say, okay, when you get to, the, like, the 13th level or you get to, like, the 10th level, there will be um, an elite rush or you're, you'll get mobbed here. Uh, sometimes you'll end up setting those up depending on the upgrades that you get because sometimes you have to give a little to get a little. You'll have to say, hey, I'm okay with dealing with elites, three stages later, if I get this upgrade, that will vastly increase my damage. You also have some very interesting weapons that you can utilize here. Uh, you have magic weapons, like wands that you can use, uh, shurikens, that kind of thing. And then your your good old-fashioned uh, guns. You, you can even do a John Woo sort of thing. I equipped uh, my Brotato with, like, six revolvers, because I thought it was cool. And there are different kinds of Brotatoes that you unlock over the course of the game by completing missions in it that will lend themselves to having different guns that are from different categories, sometimes maybe melee weapons, sometimes you know, firearms, magic projectiles, something like that. Sometimes they will benefit from having a wide variety of weapons. Sometimes they will get better because of the same weapon being equipped. In an interesting thing, though, by nature, equipping the same kinds of weapons nets you benefits because all the guns 
the gun categories, I should say, have set bonuses. So if you say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like taking explosive weapons, if you have multiple explosive weapons, it says, okay, well, you get increases to your stats because you have this number. It's similar to when you were playing like a Diablo and they have the armor sets and the more pieces that you put on, you get like a set bonus. Well, the guns in this have that. Something I really liked about the look of the game is that your your Brotato starts with a pretty straightforward look. Uh, even when you start unlocking the other characters, they have a pretty standard look, but as you put new modifications on it, it feels like a Mr. Potato Head. If you get an upgrade and it's like a nose upgrade, it smacks the new nose on you, it smacks the new hair on you, whatever it is, uh, and you see it all on your character when you get into it. So it's really fun to see how your character keeps looking different as you go through each one of these stages. Something that is less interesting are the monsters. They're basically just purple creatures. They don't have a ton of personality. I don't even know why the potato is, is fighting these purple monsters. They're not related in the theme to anything <laughs> related to potatoes that I can understand, so... They're just kind of there. They, they look fine, but they don't really have much in the way of personality. They do give you options, I, which I really liked, actually, is if you complete stage 15, you can kind of like end your run, or you can just say, nope, I'm going to keep going and keep trying to complete more stages past that. You'll also unlock different difficulty levels over the course of the game, so you can uh, try to complete those as well. It's uh, it's definitely a more honed-in version of this formula. I wouldn't say it's my favorite out of the games we're talking about today. However, if you happen to have Game Pass, or I don't think it's that expensive anyway, or you want to try something that is different in the way that it is presented to you, this could be an interesting option for you. Out of the three that I'm talking about here, I would say Halls of Torment is more traditional in the way it is framed. Probably the closest to a Vampire Survivors itself. Brotato is definitely a departure because it is in these much smaller areas that have very limited time frames on it. But you do get to see a potato that thinks it's Sylvester Stallone shooting guns. Gotta love that. But folks, I have saved the best for last. Because what if I told you that there was a Vampire Survivors inspired game where you get to play a frog? No, I'm not talking about froglike. That's a, that's a different thing entirely. Also not bad. No, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a, a true gem that came out very recently called Pesticide Not Required. I don't know what the developers were on when they came up with this, but it is wild, man. I really love this so much. What happens in this game is that you play a frog, and this frog likes to do gardening and fishing, and mining and stuff, but a bunch of pesky bugs are coming to kill you, and so you have to become a big, powerful frog so that they don't do that. Let me see if I can contextualize what this game is. Imagine if Vampire Survivors was set in Stardew Valley, that's pesticide not required. It sounds like a really bad idea. Trust me, I was with you on this. At first I was like, this seems cool, but this could go bad really fast. However, it ends up working really great. The way the game is structured, you get your frog onto the farm, and you have a small plot of land. You 
go over that plot of land, and if you have seeds for your crops, you plant them. These crops need to be watered periodically. Different kinds of crops need watering at different times. There are a couple wells around. If you pass by the well, you refill your watering can. There are also ponds. Ponds will occasionally have fish in them. There are also rocks that you can mine, and if you're close enough to it, you'll start mining them. This is all done automatically if you're just in range. If you catch fish, you gain experience from catching the fish. If you mine, you get coins, which you can use to upgrade stuff at the store run by an ant. There's a store run by an ant, by the way. Harvesting crops will also allow you to gain experience so that you can level up. And leveling up in this is basically getting a few different options available to you so that you can decide how you want to enhance your character. But I know what you're probably thinking at this point. It's not just enhancing your character, right? It's about the weapons. What are you going to do about the weapons? Here's something I think is just delightful. When you go to the store, there are two different kinds of seeds that you get. There are the crop seeds, but there are also weapon seeds. The idea is that you buy weapon seeds, and you plant them, and you grow them. And once you've grown them, you harvest them and get new weapons. And you can have five weapons in the game. Those also upgrade to level five. Each one of them does. And you do that by planting more of these weapon seeds. And so you need to plant more and more of them in order to level them up from like one to two, and then two to three you need more, and three to four and five. So you keep having to plant more of them. And you can upgrade your plots, gain more land so that you can plant, but you have to be aware of resource management because you only have so much money between these rounds, depending on how well you did. And... So now you need to also figure out, like, I need this one kind of coin, I need these coins so that I can buy the regular crops, but I also need them so that I can buy my weapons, I also need them for my uh, land upgrades. And so how do you want to use this? It's a little bit of a management sim, because you have this limited amount of money between each one of the days that you're going through, and you only have the shop available once during this day and then it closes down till the next day. This actually is structured a little bit more like Brotato in that way. Uh, you have 15 days where you are on this farm, and it goes from like day and night cycles, which depending on what kind of upgrades and everything you're using, and what kind of frogs, may actually affect the gameplay a little bit. But in general, you're going through this day, and then a new day starts, and you have access to the shop, and more waves will, will start coming at you. You also get pets. Some of them will water crops or plant seeds. Some of them will go around and collect coins for you and other loot. Uh, some of them will increase the yield of crops. And the main way that you get these pets is by defeating the elite monsters that come at you. These are just, like, big bugs. And the big bugs come and just won't stop coming, and you've got to chip away at their health until they die, and then they leave a chest, and you open the chest, and you get two options. The farm that you are on is not huge. It is pretty easy to traverse from one side to the other, but it's big enough that you have to really think about whether you want to go around it. It also, though, because of the way it is structured, allows you, it really encourages you to not stay in one place. Because you've got a pond over here, and you've got a pond over here, and you have rocks to mine in these different areas, and you have trees that, that give you healing apples and everything, and they're scattered throughout the map. So you've got to move around a little bit and really check on different areas of the map. This encourages you to move around a bit, and also gives you some management skills that you have to implement which is definitely more than what you usually do in these kind of bullet heaven games. Uh, you need to really go around the map and, and do things. I need to plant crops, I need to fish for stuff, I need to mine for stuff, you know. I have to do these different tasks 
It's very easy to do because it automatically does it when you get near them, but you do have to move a bit in order to make that happen. Everything about this game is themed around basically uh, destroying bugs and maintaining your farm over the course of seasons, because you unlock different seasons and different difficulty levels for each one of those seasons. And the the question that never really gets answered is why you're a frog. I I don't know why you're a frog on this farm. Frogs are cool, I guess. You also unlock other kinds of frogs. My favorite one, in case you're wondering, is Mignon, uh, which is a frog that looks like one of the minions from the Minions movies. And the reason that I like Mignon is that his special ability is to get one of each of the pets at the beginning of the game. And if you get more pets, you get two of them. So you basically, it's just pet heavy. But what I liked about it was that those pets, because they can do other tasks for you, like planting and watering and collecting loot, really does free you up if you can't get back to the farm because there's a bunch of bugs in your way. But I think I have completed a run with basically every one of the frogs, and they play very differently. I think that that's also worth noting, and this is true for all the games that I'm talking about here, is that because you choose different characters, similar to in Vampire Survivors where you do that, you realize that they play very differently because of the skills that they have. James Pond is uh, a character in this that has a special shield that will shield him from damage when he takes one hit. So he, he, gets, he gets a freebie. At the beginning of every day, he gets that. But the problem that he has is that he's got, like, negative 1,000 hit points. So if you get through that shield... You're basically a glass cannon after that. So now you have to start really thinking about how you want to build your character based on that. Uh, some characters will have negatives to certain skill gains and positives to others. So you have to start thinking like, okay, I don't want to obviously take bonuses to my attack frequency if I have a 100% decrease in changes to attack frequency with my character. But if I have a plus 100 to attack size, well then I want to make sure to prioritize that instead. Each one of these characters really does start to play differently even in how you are approaching the game because some of them will prioritize growing crops and gaining abilities from that. Some of them will actually not get anything for crops and will instead really focus on something like fishing. So you want to start getting more fish and more nodes coming up as fast as you possibly can and more bonuses to it. You can do some pretty great combinations in this uh, to the point where... If you just start increasing your size and your frequency and you start focusing on things like that, you get these just giant waves of these scythes and sprinklers that are just going out in all directions. Oh yeah, the, the weapons are also themed around the garden. You can have lawn mowers, you can have hay bales that you shoot out. There's lawn mower blades that can cir circle around you. Great stuff. Just excellent stuff. If I were to make criticisms of the game, uh, it is that I would have liked to see the game have the ability to continue past the 15th day. The other thing that's interesting is that at the end of the 15th day, there are no boss monsters, like actual boss monsters that come. At the end of the 15th day, your time runs out and you've completed your run. There's no boss there. So... That would have been kind of cool, at least for a capper, to say, like, oh, I, I beat this boss at the end of it. An endless mode, yeah, I would have really liked to see that, uh, to see how far you can get. You know, how many levels can you complete? Some, something like that. That would be fun. Maybe some modifications. Maybe it's not that I'm just in winter. Maybe there's a sleet storm mode, and like there's, there's frosty enemies that come at me, and, and maybe they're slower, but they hit harder. You know, d just some things like that. Uh, of course, these are just suggestions about things I'd like to see in the game. But in general, if I were to make a complaint about it, I think, I think that the lack of a boss 
uh, which is something that you saw in Halls of Torment, would be useful. Um, but also, if they had something like the Endless Mode that I saw in Brotato, that would be that would be really cool too. Uh, if they could borrow anything, those would be what I'd uh, I'd like to see. Also, even though I like that you can move around the map and that the game encourages you to do that for the pawns and for the rock nodes and stuff, I should say that they're not really all that far away from your farm. And I would have actually been okay maybe as like another mode or like a modification if they spread them out even further so that it was more of a challenge to get to them. I think that that would be an interesting thing. Uh, but again, the game came out just like a month ago, and who knows if they're going to add stuff to it. But if they did, I would kind of be interested to see what would happen with more days available where you could choose maybe the number of days that you have for the intensity. That would be kind of cool. Uh, and maybe have larger farms where these um, mining and fishing nodes were, were further away, uh, or maybe the trees for the picking apples, maybe those were further away. That would be interesting. Also, the upgrade system. So the upgrade system for permanent upgrades is done with these purple gems, and you get them by completing challenges. You get a handful of them for completing days. And you can use these to do permanent upgrades. You can also use them to upgrade uh, your house. And this is all cosmetic uh, and the garden and everything, there's really just nothing to do with the backyard and the, the the house. You can go into the backyard and check out the cool backyard you made, but it doesn't really serve a purpose. Like, you, you don't upgrade even, like, the ability to, like, put stuff in the pond or put stuff on the the crop spaces like hey crops that i unlocked you know maybe you could showcase those maybe i could see the fish in the ponds and stuff like that you know they created this big backyard that you can upgrade and they just it's just kind of there you can just wander around it uh same thing for the actual house itself you can put down new cosmetic upgrades but it's just it's it's there for show uh, it would have been kind of neat to be able to put down bookshelves or something and have additional information or display cases so that you could display different, uh, you know, crops that you've harvested or something like that, you know, just make it a little bit more personal to the experience that you had. But again, this is suggestions for a wish list that I would have if they keep adding to the game. It's not necessary. I just feel like they introduced a few things that could have been expanded upon. And it would have been nice, because I think that it's a really cool idea for a game, and definitely adds something unique to the formula. If I were to give another recommendation, uh, besides the one that I've been talking about, an alternate, I will give you a game from this last year which was called Bone Razor Minions. Uh, it was in my top ten. I can't tell you it's as good as Vampire Survivors. It has kind of more of an Atari 2600 vibe in terms of the look. And the general idea is that you go into these graveyards, you set up traps, almost like it's more of a tower defense game. But the big difference here is that you are like a necromancer. Always great. And as a necromancer, what you need to do is you need to raise the dead, and then the dead go and fight for you. And that's kind of how the auto-battling system works. It's really not you attacking the monsters, it's you raising monsters to attack the other monsters. So it, it differentiates itself in that way. And of course, there's just a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor, which you could probably get from the literal name of the game. Uh, fun enough, although, to be to be frank, if you were going to pick up something that is not Vampire Survivors, uh, I would try one of these games that I was talking about today. Uh, Bone Razor Minions is also a good choice, but yeah, uh, I really I really enjoyed these three, so you should try them out. All right, I'm gonna go back to surviving down here, folks. Don't wait up for me. 
29 minutes and 25, 6, 7. The Reaper's coming soon, isn't he? Get out now. Leave. Leave. There's a hidden passage over there. No, it's okay. You can abandon me. I'm fine. Oh! <laughs>